Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to Life Science Across the Globe. Uh, this is our third series of talks from institutes around the world. And uh, today, it's a great pleasure to travel to Latin America and uh, welcome our colleagues at University of Buenos Aires and uh, CONACET. Uh, so I think today, at least in the United States, I think everyone's looking forward to uh, an hour when we can all concentrate on uh, science. And I think part of the spirit of this lecture between uh, many countries around the world on furthering um, scientific knowledge and international cooperation. Uh, so with this, I'd like to welcome uh, my colleague, uh, Albert, Alberto Kornblitz from um, University of Buenos Aires and CONACET. Um, uh, Alberto is a very distinguished scientist who uh, has done pioneering work on alternate, alternative splicing. And he gave a wonderful uh, lecture uh, in the first round of talks, and I encourage you to, to watch it. Uh, so I'll Thank you very much, Ron. Uh, the first speaker, Gabriel Rabinovich, is undoubtedly one of the most prestigious and successful scientists of Argentina. He obtained a degree in biochemistry at the University of Córdoba and a PhD in immunology from the same university. His postdoctoral training was at the University of Buenos Aires. Currently, he's a senior investigator of the CONICET and a full professor of immunology at the University of Buenos Aires. Gabriel identified the functions of galactins, a family of carbohydrate binding proteins in cancer and immunity. His work allowed the design of novel therapeutic strategies reflected by the filing of 11 international patents. In recognition for his brilliant work, Gabriel was incorporated to the US National Academy of Sciences in 2016 as foreign member. He is also member of other international and national academies and he received several awards, including the Guggenheim Fellowship in 2006 and the Investigator of the Argentinian Nation in 2017, granted by the President of the country. He published more than 280 highly cited papers in the most influential journals, including Cell, Nature, Nature Immunology, Cancer Cell, and Nature Medicine. Okay, and now I have the pleasure to give the floor to Gabriel to tell us about his exciting work on galactins. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you very much, Alberto, for your kind invitation and introduction. And thank you very much, Ron, Janine, and Sareda for organizing and coordinating this wonderful seminar series. I will speak today about glyco checkpoints of therapeutic targets in cancer and autoimmune inflammation. So during the past decade, we have witnessed a revolution in cancer immunotherapy, mainly associated with the discovery of immune checkpoint pathways, particularly those triggered by CTLA-4 and PD-1, and the implementation of checkpoint blockade therapies, which improved overall survival and progression-free survival in a large number of patients by unleashing anti-tumor T-cell responses. However, several patients do not respond to this treatment, highlighting the need of additional immunotherapeutic approaches. Immune checkpoints are inhibitory pathways that limit the magnitude and amplitude of immune responses. They operate both during the induction and during the effector phases of an immune response, and they contribute to create immunosuppressive microenvironments by targeting different immune cell types, including cytotoxic T lymphocytes, regulatory T cells, dendritic cells, macrophages, and myeloid derived suppressor cells, but also fibroblasts and endothelial cells. There are four hallmarks that characterize an immune checkpoint. First, they are often co-opted by tumors as a mechanism of the cell resistance. They promote resolution of autoimmune and chronic inflammation. They contribute to immune tolerance at the fetal maternal interface during pregnancy, and they control resolution of microbial infections and allergic reactions. But I would like to introduce today the concept of glyco checkpoints. Although originally conceived 
as glycobiomarkers that delineate the prognosis of different tumors. Uh, recent evidence suggests that glycans play key roles as glycocheckpoints that suppress inflammatory and immune responses. To illustrate this concept, cellulated antigens present on the surface of tumor cells can be recognized by CGLEX expressed on the surface of innate immune cells. Also, galactosylated antigens can be recognized by the C-type MGL, the macrophage galactose leptin, and fucosylated antigens can be recognized by this sign. But I will focus today on galactins. Galactins are a family of soluble glycan binding proteins that preferentially recognize the disaccharide and acetyl lactosamine present in complex and glycans and core two glycans on different cell surface receptors. Galactins are highly conserved throughout the evolution from fungi to mammals, although there are galactin like folds even in viruses. Galactins are classified into three different subfamilies prototype, chimerotype, and tandem repeat galactins. We will focus today on prototype collectins, particularly on collecting one, which has one carbohydrate recognition domain that can be memorized. In response to stress or inflammations, galactins are secreted and released through an unconventional ER Golgi independent pathway, which remained a mystery for many years. In the last part of my talk, I will try to highlight some cues that could help to answer the question on how galactins are secreted. Extracellularly, galactins bind to glycosylated receptors through multivalent interactions and control receptor segregation, uh, endocytosis, and signaling. In our early studies, we identified galactin-1 as a 14-KDA beta-galactoside binding protein expressed in inflammatory macrophage. It showed broad immune inhibitory activity by suppressing T cell activation, pro inflammatory cytokine production, and also reducing immune cell survival. We found that expression of galactin 1 was elevated in tumors and highly upregulated during the acquisition of metastatic phenotypes. Analysis of TCGA data reveals that galactin-1 expression correlates with poor patient survival in most tumor types. Given the high galactin-1 expression and the broad immunoregulatory activity of this lectin, we propose that galactin-1 may play a role in tumor immune escape. In fact, we found that galactin-1 contributes to the immunosuppressive activity of melanoma cells. When we silenced galactin-1 expression in tumor cells, we found a reduction, a suppression of tumor growth, and this effect was prevented when we depleted, was partially prevented when we depleted either CD4 or CD8 positive cells, and was fully prevented when we eliminated both subpopulations. We found that silencing galactin-1 expression induced Th1 and cytotoxic T cell response in vivo. We confirmed these findings in a model of classical Hodgkin lymphoma in collaboration with Margaret Schiff from the Dana Farber Cancer Institute. So we found that Restainer cells express very high amounts of galactin 1, which contribute to the TH2 skewed immunosuppressive microenvironment, classical, typical of classical Hodgkin lymphoma. We also found that galactin 1 was upregulated in Restainer cells through an AP1-dependent enhancer controlled by Epstein-Barr virus. So data from our lab or from different labs uh, reveals that galactin-1 activates immune evasive programs in several tumor types. So we wish to understand the molecular mechanisms that control galactin-1 binding and function. So we first decided to study the glycosylation signature of different immune cell types. As I mentioned, galactin-1 interacts with lactosamine structures uh, that are present in both complex and glycans and also in core two glycans. There are two glycosyl transferases that are important for generation of galactin-1 specific ligands. One is MGA5, which generates complex branch and glycans, and the second one is C2GNT1, which promotes core 2 O glycan elongation. However, 
alpha-2,6 sialicase generated by the action of the st 6 galgual alpha-2,6 uh, salyl transferase blocks galactin-1 binding. So when we explored the glycosylation signature of the cells, we found that Th1, Th17, and CD8 positive differentiated cells express all the repertoire of glycans that are important for galactin 1 binding and induction of cell death. This includes uh, core 2 glycans, complex branching glycans, and low levels of alpha 2 6 ialic acid. In contrast, Th2 cells and FOXP3 positive regulatory cells are highly covered by alpha 2 6 ialic acid which prevents galactin-1 binding and function. Because of the importance of dendritic cells in orchestrating immune responses, we also, we also explore the role of galactin-1 glycan interactions within the dendritic cell compartment. We found that galactin-1 binds to O-glycans, to core 2 O-glycans on CD43 and promotes tolerogenic dendritic cells, which produce very high amounts of IL-27, which interacts with uh, its receptor on T cells and promote differentiation of type 1 regulatory T cells that produce also high amounts of IL-10. So we identify an immunoregulatory circuit mediated by galactin-1, IL-27, and IL-10 that connects dendritic cells with T cells. This effect in the tumor microenvironment is regulated by the SALT1 transcription factor. One of the most consistent findings is that when we block galactin 1 expression, there was an increased immune response, but also a reduction of the formation of blood vessels. Because of the crosstalk between immunosuppressive and proangiogenic programs in the tumor microenvironment, we ask whether galactin 1 glycan interactions may also control angiogenesis. Indeed, we found that galactin 1 promotes angiogenesis. We found that galactin 1 promotes angiogenesis, and this effect was prevented when we use a galactin 1 mutant lacking carbohydrate binding activity, and we did the same experiments in endothelial cells uh, that were knocked down of MDAC5. So they cannot generate complex branch and glycans. We confirmed these findings in vivo in a model of Kaposi sarcoma. To identify possible receptors that may, and signaling pathways that mediate gallet, the proangiogenic activity of galactin 1, we perform RPK signaling arrays. To our surprise, galactin 1 bound to the same receptors and triggered the same pathways as the canonical cytokine BGF. So galactin-1 promoted BGF receptor 2 phosphorylation, phosphorylation of L12, and phosphorylation of AKT. So only when we blocked BGF receptor 2, we could prevent formation, two formation induced by galactin-1. BGF receptor 2 is a glycosylative receptor composed of seven immunoglobulin-like domain and 18 N glycosylation sites. Using site-directed mutagenesis, we found that galactin-1 preferentially binds to immunoglobulin-3, 4, and 7 domains to, pre to promote angiogenesis and tubulogenesis in endothelial cells. So, uh, to make a long story short, what we found is that in response to hypoxia, galactin-1 is released from tumor cells through mechanisms that are independent of HIF-1 alpha and HIF-1 beta, but were dependent on NF-kappa-B. Then galactin-1 combined, as we mentioned, to complex in glycans on glycosylated uh, receptors, particularly on BGF receptor 2, triggering BGF-like signaling, particularly AKT and R12 for foreignation. So given these findings, we ask whether galactin-1 glycan interactions may preserve angiogenesis in tumors that are resistant to anti-BGF treatment. So we perform an experiment in mice in which we inoculated these mice with tumors that were resistant or sensitive to anti-BGF treatment. We treated these mice with anti-BGF and we analyzed both the expression of collecting one in tumors and the glycophenotype of endothelial cells. 
we found that at day four, after treatment with anti-BGF monoclonal antibodies, we found an upregulated expression of galactin-1, which was common to tumors resistant to anti-BGF and not those sensitive to anti-BGF. We also found that endothelial cells that were associated with these tumors showed low levels of alpha-2,6 sialic acid in vivo and high amounts of beta-1,6 in glycan branching. And this we found only in tumors that were resistant to anti-BGF, but not in those that were sensitive to anti-BGF treatment. So we wonder whether galactin-1 glycan interactions may play a role in resistance to anti-BGF treatment. So when we silence galactin one expression in tumors, tumors that were refractory to anti-BGF treatment in vivo, they now became sensitive to anti-BGF, and this effect was even more pronounced in galactin-1 knockout mice. So we did this, the, the same experiment, the similar experiment, but on the other side of the street. We did, we inoculated tumors that were resistant to anti-BGF in NGAT5 knockout mice lacking beta-1,6 and glycan branching in endothelial cells. And in this case, lack of complex and glycans on endothelial cells eliminated resistance to anti-BGF. On the other hand, when we inoculated tumors that are sensitive to anti-BGF into sp 6 gal one knockout mice lacking alpha-2,6 sialic acid on the endothelial cells, tumors that were sensitive to anti-BGF treatments, they became refractory, resistant to anti-BGF. So in summary, Tumors that are sensitive to anti-BGF treatments, endothelial cells of these tumors are highly covered by alpha-2,6 linked sialic acid. In contrast, tumors that are refractory to anti-BGF treatment express very high amounts of beta-1,6 in glycan branching and low levels of alpha-2,6 linked sialic acid which uh, allowed galactin-1 binding to BGF receptor 2, particular to immunoglobulin 3, four and seven domains promoting BGF-like signaling and revascularization. So we wish to integrate the immunoregulatory and proangiogenic activities of galactin-1, and we selected for this purpose the pancreatic adenocarcinoma model. Why pancreatic adenocarcinoma? Because it has the lowest survival rates, the poor prognosis, and it's resistant to all types of immunotherapy. So we performed these experiments in collaboration with Pilar Navarro from Hospital del Mar, and we found in Barcelona, and what we found is that in this particular model, galactin-1 expression is particularly upregulated in human pancreatic steric cells. So we first used transgenic mice that uh, recapitulate human pancreatic adenocarcinoma, and we cross these mice in galactin-1 uh, knockout background. We then use also co-cultures of human pancreatic steroid cells with tumor cells or with immune cells. So when we block galactin-1 expression, we found a reduction of tumor metastasis, particularly to the liver, a reduction of angiogenesis, and an increase of CD8 and CD4 positive T cells, and a reduction of, of, the, of the recruitment of myeloid-derived suppressor cells. Myeloid-derived suppressor cells are a highly enigmatic cell in the tumor microenvironment as it promotes tumor progression through different mechanisms, but mainly by promoting immunosuppression and angiogenesis. So it's a perfect model to analyze the role of galactin-1 in the tumor microenvironment. So to make a long story short, what we found was that galactin-1 binds to receptors, to glycosylated receptors on myeloid derived suppressor cells, triggering angiogenic and immunosuppressive programs on these cells and contributing to tumor progression. One of the most uh, critical questions, one of the most important questions is how can we target galactin-1 for cancer therapy? So the advantages of blocking galactin-1 in the tumor microenvironment are that we can stimulate the immune system, but at the same time, we can block tumor angiogenesis. So we first tested glycamine, lactulosamines that bind to the carbohydrate binding sites of galactins. 
and it blocked galactin 1, but also other members of the galactin family. So the same happened with small molecules when we use small molecule inhibitors. But we decided to generate anti galactin 1 specific neutralizing monoclonal antibody. Recently, we generated a new specific antibody it has neutralizing activity, immunostimulatory and anti-regulatory activity, and it blocked galactin-1 and neutralized galactin-1, but not other members of the galactin family. It has a very high affinity, and it mapped in epitopes that were outside the ligand binding group. When we block galactin-1 expression in vivo using an anti-galactin-1 antibody, we found a reduction of tumor volume. Also, we found a reduction of angiogenesis, an increased CDA-positive T-cell response, a decrease of phosphorylation of BGF receptor 2. And when we combined the anti-BGF with the anti-galactin-1 antibodies, we also eliminated resistance to anti-BGF treatment. So in summary, galactin-1 functions as a glyco checkpoint that links tumor immunity and angiogenesis. It promotes tumor immune escape in different tumor types. It induces selective deaths of Th1, Th17, and CDA-positive T cells by a glycosylation-dependent mechanisms. It delivers tolerogenic signals to dendritic cells and mild device suppressor cells. It favors expansion of regulatory T cells in different tumor types. It promotes polarization of macrophages to an M2 phenotype. It links tumor hypoxia to angiogenesis, activates BGF receptor to signaling and preserves angiogenesis in anti-BGF resistant tumors. Although I didn't speak about this work, in collaboration with Jose Conejo Garcia, we also found that Galactin 1 links commensal microbiota to tumor promoting inflammation. Although we focus our attention in this talk on the role of Galactin 1 in three hallmarks of cancers, as defined by Hannah Hahn and Weinberg, avoiding immune destruction, tumor promoting inflammation, and inducing angiogenesis, galactins, and in particular galactin-1, play key roles in different hallmarks of cancer, not only in the three ones. But galactin-1 is not the only glyco checkpoint in cancer. As I mentioned before, the C-type leptin MGL is also important in promoting immunosuppression. In collaboration with Juan Garcia Vallejo from the U University in Amsterdam, we found that glioblastoma cells express uh, high amounts of TN antigens, GALNAC, which is recognized by the C type lectin MGL and promotes M2 macrophage polarization and immunosuppression in the glioblastoma microenvironment. So, as we mentioned, another feature, another hallmark of an immune checkpoint is that it promotes resolution of autoimmune chronic inflammation. So we found during the past years that administration of galactin-1 or in genetic delivery suppresses autoimmune inflammation in different models, including arthritis, multiple sclerosis, uveitis, colitis, inflammatory bowel disease, diabetes, and orchitis. In fact, galactin-1 knockout mice show enhanced susceptibility to encephalomyelitis, arthritis, and inflammatory bowel disease, highlighting the role of endogenous galactin-1 in suppressing autoimmune inflammation. In fact, we recently found that deletion of galactin-1 leads to spontaneous autoimmunity during aging. What about the central nervous system? What about central nervous system inflammation? We found that in a model of multiple sclerosis, we found that in response to anti-inflammatory cytokines, astrocytes are the cells in the central nervous system that produce the highest amount of galactin-1. Galactin-1 binds to CD45, to core 2 glycans on CD45, promoting polarization of M2 microglia and preventing neurodegeneration induced by inflammation. So, can we capitalize on galactin-1 glycan interactions for treating autoimmune diseases? I mentioned before, that galactin-1 suppresses autoimmune inflammation in different models. 
However, high concentrations of recombinant galactin-1 are required to achieve robust anti-inflammatory activity, and galactin-1 is highly unstable in inflammatory microenvironments. So we ask, why? Is it related to the monomer dimer equilibrium of this protein? Is it related to the low affinity interactions between GAL1 and specific carbohydrate ligands? Or is it related to the sensitivity to adverse inflammatory microenvironments, particularly pH and oxidation? Using side directed mutagenesis, we generated different mutants lacking uh, some specific biochemical and biophysical parameters. And we choose three of these mutants that we call super galactin 1 variants. These super galactin 1 variants have superior anti inflammatory activity, even at very low concentrations. So, another hallmark of an immune checkpoint is that it contributes to immune tolerance at the fetal maternal interface. In fact, we found that during pe pregnancy, during the first term pregnancy, and in response to progesterone, uh, galactin-1 is released by the trophoblast and uh, generates tolerogenic circuits mediated by the enriched cells, anti-cells. In fact, we found in collaboration with Sandra Blois and Peter Ark that galactin-1 knockout female mice have increased fetal loss, and this effect was uh, rescued when we use recombinant galactin-1, when we injected mice with recombinant galactin-1. We also found in the clinical setting that women with spontaneous recurrent abortions have increased levels of anti-galactin-1 blocking antibody in their blood. So finally, Two important hallmarks of an immune checkpoints is that they impair resolution of microbial infections and also limit allergic reactions. So to make a long story short, we found that different pathogens, different parasites and bacteria, namely uh, the protozoan, the Panosoma cruzi, Yersinia enterocolitica, the bacteria Yersinia enterocolitica, and also Chlamydia trachomatis, use galactin-1 to infect and to evade the immune response. Also, we found that galactin-1 limits allergic airway inflammation and eosinophilia in mouse models. So the final question is how galactin-1 is secreted. So in collaboration, uh, we collaborated with Vijay Ratiman from Yukon Health and in a model of sepsis uh, as a consequence of LPS sensing, we found that galactin-1 was secreted uh, as a danger-associated molecular partner, as a damp, through mechanisms involving non-canonical inflammasome activation, activation of caspase 4, 5 in humans, and 11 in mice, and also uh, cleavage of gastrin D and formation of pores plus gastrin D. So galactin-1 is secreted as a damp through mechanisms involving non-canonical inflammasome activation and preoptosis. This paper has been, the study has been provisionally accepted and will appear probably very soon. So I hope I convince you that galactin-1 is an immune checkpoint that promotes tolerogenic dendritic cells, promote dysfunction of these cells, favor differentiation of regulatory cells, and polarization of macrophages and microglia, and also controls endothelial cell biology. In physiologic settings, galactin-1 promotes immune cell homeostasis and prevents aberrant inflammation. In pathologic settings, it behaves as the sweet case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Uh, in, in some cases, it behaves like a good guy, suppressing autoimmunity, inhibiting inflammation-induced neurodegeneration, and controlling allergic airways inflammation. But in another case, it behaves as a bad guy, as Mr. Hyde, thwarting anti-tumor immunity, promoting metastasis, and favoring parasite and bacterial infection. So using all this fundamental knowledge, we generated recently two different platforms. One, the first one is the Cancer Immunotherapy and Antiangiogenesis anti -angiogenesis Transfer Technology Platform based mainly on anti-galactin-1 neutralizing antibodies 
And the second platform is mainly based on the super GAL1 for inflammation and autoimmunity. We are currently in the process of uh, clinical validation and preclinical studies uh, to demonstrate safety and toxicity of these agents before starting phase one. So finally, I would like to thank all my group for the hard work, all the current members of the group, the former members of the group, our wonderful collaborations and the agencies that supported our work during the past years, the national agencies, the Argentinian national agencies, and the international agencies. So thank you very much, and I am now open for questions. Thank you, Gabby. A very interesting study, and indeed, Galactin-1 appears to be um, the culprit responsible for anti-VEGF mediated, uh, I mean, resistance to anti-VEGF mediated uh, immune therapy. So uh, as we head towards the discussion, so in your talk, we learned about one mechanism for this resistance, which is mediated by Galactin-1. So are there other mechanisms by which this resistance can develop? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sareda, for, for this interesting question. Uh, there, are, there are many mechanisms that have been demonstrated, both intrinsic mechanisms and adaptive mechanisms of resistance uh, to anti-VGF particularly. Uh, some are mediated by, by FGF, some are mediated by PIGF, different growth factor receptors, and there are some uh, mechanisms that are mediated by myeloid-derived suppressor cells. So there are some cells that in the absence of angiogenesis, in the absence of PGF, contribute to angiogenesis. So some of them are growth factor receptors, such as PIGF, FGF, some of them are TH17 cells, which have been also shown to contribute to this process and myeloid rice suppressor cells as well. So there are several mechanisms that together contribute to uh, resistance to anti-BGF therapies, but there are also many mechanisms that contribute to, anti -PD to resistance to anti-PD-1 therapy. Uh, so it is very important because if we can identify the mechanisms, we can target this mechanism to the, for combination purposes uh, for cancer therapy. Hmm. Interesting. So galactin ones are not the sole culprit. There are a whole bunch of them acting out there. Um, so with that, we move on to questions from the audience. Uh, audience, in the interest of time, I will be reading out your questions today. Our next question is from uh, Professor Jitu Mayer. Uh, uh, he would like to know, how does the system distinguish between the roles and functions of the galactins one and three, and if they bind to the same sugar ligand receptors? Thank you very much for, for this question. This is, uh, this is a great question. Uh, in fact, you know, in, in, previous, in previous work, we thought that they were the same receptors. But now, after we have the, the glycan arrays, we can distinguish the glycans that are recognized by Galactin 1, 2, 3, and others. So there are differences in the glycan specificity and also differences in the receptors. So we, we, we now know that we, we, we need to focus not only on protein-glycan interactions, but also on protein-protein interactions. So the receptors that different individual galactins find are different, and the glycans can be also subtly different. So they play different roles. There is another, another level of difference between the interaction of individual galactins. Another type of lattices that are generated uh, between different galactins. Galactin 1 is a prototype galactin that act via multivalent interactions. Galactin 3, oligomerases. So the lattices, the supramolecular complexes on the surface of the cells are different and they trigger either anti inflammatory responses or pro inflammatory responses. So we need to focus on protein glycan interactions, on the protein itself, but also on the lattices that are formed on the surface of the cells. Hmm. All right. Uh, thank you. And the next question, ah, next question is on protein engineering. So uh, can you design drugs that can uh, uh, 
affect uh, can uh, can you I guess I'll rephrase this question here. Can you design drugs to avoid side effects, drugs against galactin one, uh, to avoid the side effects uh, caused by the general drugs? Well, in fact, in fact, galactin one always does the same functions. So it promotes immunosuppressive, antiallergenic, dendritic cells. It always promotes immunosuppression. So this this this, this, this issue is, is good for some pathological settings and is, and is bad for some pathologic settings. In fact, what we did with a super galactin protein is to, to design a protein that can be more stable and can be used for treatment to, to, to avoid aberrant inflammation and for treating autoimmune diseases. So, because galactin 1 does everything, so promotes uh, tolerogenic dendritic cells, kills activated T cells, also promotes M2 macrophage polarization. So it's immunosuppressive in general, but in some instances is immune pro-inflammatory as well. But uh, what we do is to block galactin-1 expression using antibodies in cases where galactin-1 is a bad guy, where galactin-1 is Mr. Hyde. Uh, this is a case of cancer or parasite infection. But in the cases that galactin-1 is a good guy, we need to introduce more galactin-1 because there is down regulation of galactin-1 in tissues in these cases. So we need more galactin-1 and galactin-1 that is stable, galactin-1 that resists the adverse effect of inflammatory microenvironments for treating. So we need agonist and antagonist. Antagonist of galactin-1 to block galactin-1 in cancer and infection and to induce more galactin-1 or to treat with galactin agonist in autoimmunity and inflammatory diseases. All right, thank you. Uh, our next question, uh, uh, this is interesting. So is there any relation between galactin receptors and transcription factors in tumor progression? Yeah, well, this is this is a, a, a very good question because some of the functions I spoke mostly about the extracellular functions of galactins, but in fact there are many intracellular functions of galactins. So there are intracellular functions of galactins that are related to induction of some transcription factors that are involved uh, in uh, in the progression of cancer. In fact. As I mentioned, galactins participate in almost all formats of cancer, also promoting tumor progression, interacting with oncogenes such as KRAS, interfering with signaling pathways, and also uh, interfering with transcription factors. So that there, are, there are also some intracellular functions, and the overall function of galactins is the balance between intracellular and extracellular functions of galactins. I only spoke about, uh, I only talked today about extracellular functions of galactins, but there are many other intracellular functions. All right, so a balance between extracellular and intracellular functions. All right, so we are uh, probably the last question for this uh, session. This is regarding, we go back to VEGF receptors. So here's a question. Does galactin-1 only react with anti-VEGF2? Or does it also react with other anti-VEGF receptors, maybe to a lesser extent? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for this, uh, this question. In fact, we tested this effect in this particular study, and we found that galactin-1 only cross-links BGF receptor 2. And we did some experiments by immunoprecipitating only BGF receptor 1, also BGF receptor 1 and BGF receptor 3, uh, with galactin-1, and it does not bind to 1 and 3. When we evaluated the glycosylation status of these receptors, so uh, BGF receptor 2 uh, has low levels of alpha-2,6 hyaluronic acid, high amounts of uh, beta-1,6 in glycan branching. So even when these three receptors have the same number of glycosylation sites, there are changes in the glycosylation status of each particular glycosylated receptor. So uh, BGF receptor 2 is, has low levels of sialic acid, but BGF receptor 1 and 3 have high amounts of alpha-2,6 sialic acid. As I mentioned in my talk, galactin-1 does not bind to alpha-2,6 sialic acid. So it's a question of particular sialylation of these receptors versus BGF receptor 2. Thank you, Gabby. Many interesting discussion points here, but in the interest of time, we will move on to our next speaker now. Uh, 
Thank you once again, Gabby. Our next speaker is Rolando Gonzalez-Jose, who's gonna to talk to us about science and human rights in Argentina. The 